So we're here sitting down and continuing to take a different look at some of these concepts and some of the evidence that would support the reason that I've come to these concepts and that I've tried to put them forth. Now, just as a, a general concept, what we're going to be calling this, as you can tell by the introduction portion of the video, is don't believe the hype. And the reason that I want to do that or that I, that concept came to mind, that title came to mind, is simply on account of the fact that as a practitioner, as a former student, as a teacher at a previous point, as somebody who's currently pursuing my Master's of Science in Health Science Education, I see a lot of hype that has been culturally ingrained in students and teachers and practitioners in not just osteopathic manual therapy, but varying manual therapy practices. We often see this transmission take the form of the person that teaches me, as, as a given individual, would be considered the authority or the teacher. They teach me something, so they must be some form of expert, they must have some form of expert level knowledge, therefore what they're saying must have some strong truth to it. That's the best that we understand. We take that information and we reinforce it by having that be the story that essentially guides us, guides us to our perceived success, guides us to our you know, perceived level of expertise, and then what ends up happening is we reutilize that story, we pass it down the line, and then everybody ends up with the same kind of origin story with questionable validity, questionable reliability. These concepts may not be all they're cracked up to be. They may be very useful in the transmission of a skill set such that the way you learn it, you're then able to repeat it and teach it to other people so that they can repeat the skill. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate, that doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. Maybe when it initially showed up it was as accurate as you could get, and that's fine. But we don't want to stay stuck on this hype train if we don't have to. We can evaluate evidence that exists, we can observe patterns, and we can start to come to maybe better stories to become closer and closer to what can be considered a positivistic truth. And now when I use the term positivistic, it's a philosophy of science where positivism essentially suggests that there is a truth that exists outside of human perception. So regardless of who, it, who is looking at something, there is a truth that can be found, but we may need to use varying methods in order to do that. So if we continue to look at what we're finding, if we continue to improve our understanding of things in a positivistic sense from a philosophy of science. Now there are other philosophies of science, there's constructivism, there's post-positivism. Constructivism essentially suggesting that uh, knowledge is, or truth is constructed by the person constructing it. So I would be the bringer of truth, I would be the person who, there's my truth, right? I learn different things and then that informs my truth. Post-positivism generally says that both are true. Positivism, there is the possibility under certain circumstances that there is a truth that exists outside of the person viewing it or outside of the perception. And then there is the reality that most of our knowledge is constructed by the individual constructing it and then by the person essentially digesting it or taking it in. Now, that just kind of gives you a grounding as to some of the reasons why I'm doing this. So what we're going to look at here, or what we're going to talk about here, is why I speak about things with palpation as well as diagnostic procedures. So when I say have an organized approach, you know, macro identifies micro as far as uh, diagnostic processes are concerned and what we're going to touch on more here is having an organized approach. Also when I talk about palpation, move from the known to the unknown, accuracy is not the number one necessity, motion is and we'll talk about that by rolling through some papers here. So the first one that we bring up it comes from around 1980. Uh, it's called Classification of Diagnostic Tests Used with Osteopathic Manipulation. The lead author was Yuri Dinar. Uh, Myron C. Beale was a co-author, John P. Goodridge was a co-author, William L. Johnston, uh, the creator of Functional Technique was a co-author, 
Zvig Harney, who I'm not 100% sure who they were, uh, Fredrick, Frederick L. Mitchell Jr., uh, so the son of the creator of Muscle Energy, a, a current proponent of Muscle Energy, Johnny Upledger, uh, David G. McConnell. So there's some historically big names on this paper. Essentially what ended up happening was they took uh, five physicians, gave them five well-defined cases of low back pain, asked them to diagnose what they noted generally was that there was no consistency with the order of the tests. There was no consistency of the tests that one practitioner would use with one patient than with another patient. So there was a consistency problem with tests. That being said, there did seem to be some organizational structure for each individual. And then what they did was because they didn't see any consistency in the approach initially, they tried to classify the tests. They tried to identify a pattern that would allow one to classify the tests or give them some structure that they could then maybe plug in and be systematic. So this was from around 1980, and I'm just gonna kind of scroll down to show a useful piece of this that will help me talk to the point. Uh, you could accuse anybody of pulling out quotes or pulling out things uh, of cherry picking data to prove their point, and that is not necessarily untrue in most circumstances because you're trying to prove a point. You're moving towards something you're trying to use information or evidence to inform your argument. So hopefully I'm not simply cherry picking, hopefully I'm helping inform you as to why I'm doing what I'm doing. So we scroll down, hopefully this doesn't end up being you know, uh, discomforting as I do this. So I'm just gonna read this out, you'll see the highlighted portion. It may not pop such that you can read it appropriately, which is why I'm going to read it. The sequence in which tests from the five test classes described are employed in practice is sometimes confusing to the observer. The order presented above reconstructs some of the logic the decision-making process entailed in the use of the tests. In reality, however, they are often not used in this sequence because of the different positions they require of the patient. To save time and spare the patient discomfort, the examiner usually follows a positional sequence for each patient standing, sitting, supine, then prone. Within each position, the test sequence usually follows the order given above with minor repetitions of some tests for confirmation of findings. So that paragraph points to the general reality that the order is determined. There's not always a clear order. There may be an ideal order. It's not always utilized, but the order that is utilized by many of these practitioners or the, the five practitioners at least that were observed is an order that essentially has a positional hierarchy. As they describe, standing, seated, supine, uh, followed by prone, if I remember correctly as I read it. Uh, yeah, standing, sitting, supine, prone. Uh, lateral recumbent isn't absolutely used there, at least for the diagnostic process. So one of the things that they're showing as a hierarchy here, in at least at the point in 1980 with the five practitioners that they were observing, was that they had a positional order that allowed them to get the information they wanted as well as allowed them to maintain some comfort for the patient so the patient doesn't feel like they're on a rotisserie and flipping and flopping just so you can run the test you want to run or run the diagnostic procedure you want to run you're getting the information that's required with the least amount of effort or discomfort for the patient so that's fairly important they suggested early on in the paper that there, and even in this paragraph, that the, the order isn't absolutely clear. However, there does seem to be some order, right? So we note an early investigation of diagnostic procedures in osteopathic practice that orderliness or organization may be a possible issue, okay? We move over, and this takes us to about 2005, if I remember correctly, Yep, 2005, so we have a paper here, Inter Observer Reliability of Osteopathic Palpatory Diagnostic Tests of Lumbar Spine Improvements for, from Consensus Training. Uh, this is brought to us by Dr. Brian Dagenhart, Dr. Karen Snyder, Dr. Eric Snyder, Dr. and Jane C. Johnson. So we look at this and the title would entail that what we're looking at is the primary concern is inter-rater reliability, which in many cases with hands-on diagnostics, osteopathy or otherwise, 
is noted as having poor inter-rater reliability. So if two people are running the same test, you're, or two people are trying to diagnose the same thing, you have a problem that they don't agree. What they're saying in this general paper, and I have the abstract up here, and I have a highlighted portion that I will read out, but essentially as an overarching commentary, what they did is they took some people, they trained them to do the same tests on purpose. So they, they essentially did a pretest, they trained them to do the same tests on purpose, and after the consensus training, they retested for inter-rater reliability. Right, so they're testing first what, you know, ask them to find the structure, uh, see what the inter-rater reliability is, provide them the consensus, consensus training, and then retest the inter-rater reliability after that training. Uh, during the initial evaluation of inter-observer reliability, kappa ranged from negative 0 0.02 to 0 0.34 within the poor to fair reliability range. So prior to the consensus training, the inter-rater reliability, the ability of people to look for a structure and agree as to whether or not they found it, or if they found the same thing, was poor to fair. So with normal osteopathic training, inter-rater reliability, at least in this context, was noted as poor to fair. Following consensus training, reliability improved, rising into the moderate range for tissue texture changes, and into the substantial range for tenderness assessments, reliability for, for positional asymmetry in the transverse plane and rotational asymmetry, and remember we're looking at the lumbar column here, were improved but remained in the fair range. The authors concluded that consensus training improved the inter-observer inter reliability of common osteopathic palpatory tests of the lumbar spine. So if we purposely train people to test things the same way then we tend to agree that we're finding the same things. Reliability improves. This is shown again with the same research group in a later paper, Maintenance and Improvement of Interobservable Reliability of Osteopathic Palpatory Tests over a four-month period. So what they did is they kind of re-ran this assessment in a slightly different way, or re-ran this concept, concept for an experiment in a slightly different way, and they took it out to four months to see if it was something that could be maintained over time. What we get, uh, generally speaking, is the test, or sorry, I'll read from this, and this again points to this concept that if we purposely make sure that people are doing the same procedure, the same steps, they will come to very similar conclusions. The test for static segmental positional asymmetry of the transverse processes in the horizontal plane had moderate to substantial reliability in all successions, Tests for tissue texture abnormalities had moderate reliability in five of the six sessions. Tests for resistance to anterior spring of the spinous processes had moderate reliability for three of the six sessions. So we're seeing some things were more reliable than others. So the transverse processes in the horizontal plane, moderate to substantial reliability consistently in all six sessions. Tissue texture abnormalities reliable in five of the six sessions, resistance to anterior springing, so when you actually create uh, essentially a passive overpressure, you push into the lumbar column, was had moderate reliability for three of the six sessions. The test for tenderness had substantial rely to almost perfect reliability for all six sessions. So when you poke somebody and it, you know they or you're looking for a tender spot, it seems to be one of the easier things to find, probably because it hurts and the person will respond in kind. In general, inter-observer reliability improved over time, and not equally in the classifications of tests that they were looking for. Examiners were able to maintain and improve inter-observer reliability of four lumbar diagnostic palpatory tests over a four-month period. So again, we get information that suggests if we have people purposely doing the same things, they will come to very similar conclusions. Not perfectly, uh, but they will come to similar conclusions. Now, it should be mentioned that just becoming, because we come to the same conclusions by running the same tests does not mean we're accurate, does not mean we're correct. It means that we're running the same tests, we're trained to do the same things, and make the same inferences. So if I push into the lumbar column and it doesn't go forwards, then I believe that it is flexed, because as I push from posterior to anterior, it should essentially extend, it should go forwards, so if it doesn't, I believe it is flexed. That doesn't necessarily mean it's flexed. If somebody's laying on their stomach, they're already in an extension biased position. 
They may not necessarily be able to go any further. They may be tense. They may resist. They may be very uncomfortable. You may push too hard. There's all kinds of reasons that the test wouldn't give you what you want it to give you. But the important thing here is that inter-observer reliability, which is what they were looking for, seems to improve if we have everybody do the same thing. It doesn't mean we we're more accurate. It means we agree more or we find a similar inference or a similar conclusion. One of the other things that we end up seeing as we assay the literature, assay research, is we see that a paper such as this, how type and number of training sessions influence the reliability of palpation. The, in the general abstract, again, there is a useful conclusion as far as driving a concept. Here we get the type of training session seems not to influence reliability of palpation accuracy. The improvement of reliability during the training session seems to be related to the experience of examiners, which plays an important role in reliability in the learning experience. So the more experience you have, the more accurate you seem to get. Now, the more accurate you seem to get, if you are not following a clear cut, clear cut process, would likely point to what would be called implicit learning, learning without doing it on purpose. So every time you do something, you get information as feedback, whether you pay attention to it or not. So over time, that builds up and you will likely get better at doing something, whether you know you're getting better at it or not. You may be get, getting better at making a mistake, but you are getting better at something through the implicit processes. So if somebody's more experienced, they tend to be more accurate. The amount of time you spend doing something seems to improve the skill of it. Now, if we take these two pieces of information together, that consensus training seems to improve agreement between practitioners about what they're finding, and that accuracy is mostly influenced by what you do over time or the amount of time you're doing it. If we give you a very clear way to do things or a process or enable you to create your own process and your own pattern that you'll get better at that pattern because you spend time on it. So maybe it would be of use to use the consensus training concept, give people a clear cut process and have them repeat it over and over and over again. And that can drive a skill that can drive accuracy, that can drive reliability, that can drive uh, repeatability. What we want to take a look at very briefly is just a very simple study that talks about the accuracy of palpation and we get this in the form of a paper reliability of diagnosis of somatic dysfunction among osteopathic physicians and medical students um, this is from 2012 and we'll just read the general abstract here several studies have assessed inter-examiner correlation of diagnosis of somatic dysfunction the study looks at the simple task of palpating the asis of both a live and a fixed plastic model to determine whether examination results are reliable Expected osteopathically trained individuals would be able to do this with reasonable accuracy. However, we tested the results of 151 examiners and found low levels of agreement on diagnosis. So we point again to this concept that people do not seem to agree on finding what should ideally be a fairly prominent bony structure. The ASIS, even in larger individuals, individuals with more muscle, in individuals with more adiposity, uh, muscle can obscure this under certain circumstances. Adiposity would obscure the ASIS in some circumstances, but that tissue can fairly easily be moved out of the way, and you can, should ideally be able to identify ASIS in most people. That is what we are trained to believe, but when looking at 151 examiners, we're noting that that doesn't seem to be the case. Furthermore, the fixed models ASIS were set at equal, okay? The ASISs in the plastic model were purposely made equal. They were made level on a measurable thing. Yet most examiners, 89.2%, chose either left or right. So they were saying that there was an asymmetry, that the left side, the right side was up, was down. However, they were using terminology here. On an equal model, on something that we can prove is equal and level, most of these people have this ingrained belief that ASIS must be unlevel, it must be unequal, therefore they will essentially make that claim. So we get some interesting information. Even when things are equal, we have osteopathic practitioners having this ingrained belief and ingrained experience that they're unequal. 
right? And that's the call that they make. The conclusion that they provide here, or the suggestion that they provide here, is based on these statistically significant results, we conclude that palpation for symmetry of two pair structures, such as ASIS, is not an accurate way to assess for SD or somatic dysfunction. It's important to have a standardized approach to diagnosis because comparing one ASIS with the other does not seem to be the best way to teach students how to diagnose. So there's a lot of pieces of information that I'm drawing on here. I'm using five pieces of research to try to narrate this concept. So there's more things that I've read, there's more things that I've experienced, there's more things that I've seen, but my aim here is to walk you through this in a way that it, should you choose to listen for long enough or pay attention through the whole video, that I can start to make this point. We keep getting this arrow that seems to be pointing to this concept of having an organized framework that many people use or that multiple people use that improves agreement when we're looking for something, that palpation is not as accurate as we would like it to be, and that using static landmarks or bony landmarks are not ideal. One of the things that we should ideally know is that in most human bodies, anatomy is, even paired anatomy, is not symmetrical. It's just not going to be. We very rarely see things that are symmetrical. It's one of the reasons why, say, in an aesthetic sport such as bodybuilding, symmetry becomes a very interesting thing. Most people are asymmetrical, even when very well developed, and people get rewarded for improved symmetry or symmetry that is above and beyond the people that they're competing against. It is not a normal thing to be perfectly symmetrical. Therefore, we should expect that using paired bony landmarks would not be symmetrical. There are many things that we can see this clearly on. There are other things that we have a harder time seeing this on. It's not an ideal way to do this. That's why I suggest accuracy is not the number one necessity movement is or motion is. We should ideally be able to identify when there's a motion problem, a lack of motion, more than we should be able to identify if things are level, right? Static portion of this, symmetry portion as far as are these things level, is not going to give us what we hope it's going to give us. The presence or absence of motion gives us more, and we should ideally be aiming to be organized in our approach, and we should ideally be aiming to have a, the similar approach over time. So if we repeatedly do the same thing on purpose, we know why we're doing it, we know what we're looking for, we know its strengths, we know its weaknesses, we know how to deal with it when it doesn't give us what we're looking for, how to create a pattern of diagnostic maneuvers, how to create a new pattern of diagnostic maneuvers because there are times when you have to, but these all are born out in research that seems to be giving us consistent results that we don't agree as often as we would like to believe, we're not as accurate as we would train our students to believe, and we don't really seem to teach people to be organized. That's why the suggestion keeps popping up in varying research as early as 1980 in my, in my understanding, possibly earlier than that, that I haven't seen. In looking at old osteopathic textbooks that talk about diagnosis, they tell you, they name off lists of tests, they don't tell you how to do them, how to sew them together, they just teach you a test and then say, yeah, this is what you do. That may be why there's historical observation that osteopathic practitioner's diagnostic approach is not consistent. It's not the same between patients. Therefore, what we're starting to see is it's advantageous to be organized and do it on purpose. So that's what I want to leave you with, is that I've taken you through some papers, I've given you some explanations, some kind of didactic lecture style material that would suggest to you why I'm saying what I'm saying, why it would be of benefit to you to take this on as a practitioner. If you're an educator, this would likely benefit you as well. Have an organized approach to diagnosis. Have a guiding framework that you can communicate clearly. Don't simply tell people that this is guided by underlying concepts. Tell them what they are, how each test is showing them. You have to show people explicitly. You can't just give them concepts. They won't figure it out on their own. They have to see something. And when they see it, it seems to work better when you tell them, this is the concept, this is the guiding con concept, underlying piece of information. This is an example of it. This is an example of it. This is an example of it. 
if you give them a few examples of it, then they're able to take that on a little bit better. So that's why I purposely go through these concepts in as many ways as I'm able to, to try to get this out to people who are interested. And I understand that not everybody's going to be interested. This is project for me to get things out of my head. My motivation is to share because I see things that my perspective may be helpful in, but of course I think I'm right. And I know that it's not possible for me to be right about everything. I know that I'm working towards identifying as much truth as I can leverage or get as close to something that's accurate as I can. But I know that I'm flawed. I know that as humans we're flawed. I know that I'm working on being more right over time. And I'm trying to share the process of how I'm coming to where I, I come to as well as share it with you so that maybe it helps you. So hopefully this helps and we will kind of reconvene over time on video and I have no idea when you're going to be watching this but what I would like to suggest is that I'm going to continue to have these talks, I'm going to continue to put out this material and I continue to suggest that you don't believe the hype, that you learn how to search, you learn how to weigh evidence, don't believe the hype.